We will start off with a true green tech and very future-driven company aspiring to put data to work to ultimately save our planet. So please give, give a warm welcome to our evolution and Torbjörn Tingåker. Welcome, Torbjörn. I'm Jeffy. Thank you very much for that uh, presentation. Thank you very much for having me here, being able to present. Uh, my name is uh, Torbjörn Tingåker. It was actually intended that Erik Josefsson would be here to present today, but life is life. He is home in the bed, sick. So I uh, took the opportunity instead. Uh, I am a CTO at the Airborne LiDAR Bathymetry Group within Hexagon. Hexagon is a huge company, 23,000 employees. But this bathymetric LiDAR unit is actually located here in Jönköping, where we develop and produce uh, airborne sensors. But uh, more about that a bit later. This graph is one way to present uh, the development of uh, mankind. This is the, uh, ex expresses the last uh, 2,000 years, and we see it measured in population. We can clearly see that mankind has scaled, and we have scaled rapidly, especially uh, yeah, the last part of it. However, as you know, we have not done this in a fully sustainable way. If we uh, yeah, take uh, take a little example. We take the entire time of Earth, 4.3 billion years, compress it down into one year. Then the last 23 minutes would represent the time when humans been around. That's basically the time on New Year's Eve when you look for your shoes, trying to get out, look at the fireworks. And during these 23 minutes, we have actually consumed 30% of the resources of this planet, and most of it on the very last minutes. That was maybe a complicated way of expressing it. Maybe this is easier. Today, the consumption rate of the resources we have uh, is actually twice as much, much as it can, uh, should have been. We need two planets today, if we would like to continue uh, as we currently do. Two planets is not an option, but the option is to be twice as good. We can be twice as efficient, more productive, reduce waste uh, generation, simply be better. And uh, why stop at two times? If we become two times as good, why not three times, four times? So Hexagon has always had uh, the data in focus. It's been like that for decades. Reality capture, that's what we often think about when we t uh, think about data. It's uh, physical measurements, distance from uh, A to B, it can be the properties of an object, uh, mapping 3D environments. Uh, it can be uh, small scale, big scale, a machine, a factory, a city. 
it can be the sea floor, uh, it can be many things. This data is the input to the digital twins. Uh, and these digital twins, this is where the simulation and design goes on. With a digital twin of a, of a city, we can do uh, shadow models, uh, sound models. We can uh, do efficiency planning. Um, we can also, uh, for instance, if there would be a river in that town, simulate uh, flooding and uh, direct infrastructure uh, to, uh, um, yeah, to, to save uh, material and lives. These digital twins are also used uh, for location intelligence. So uh, uh, sensors being out in the real world can use the digital twin uh, to find their location and also use the digital twin and their know-how of how to locate themselves, use this to navigate in the real world and at the digital twin at the same time. This is not something that starts and stops, it's a wheel spinning constantly. And um, there is always the desire to make it more and more autom autonomous, uh, reducing the need for human intervention. But to put this into the con context of this presentation, I take an example of uh, Hexagon R Evolution Initiative. So, um, Hexagon, or Evolution, acquired um, a solar plant farm and actually uh, built another one. And there were three reasons for this. One was to get hands-on experience how it is to run a thing like that. It's uh, the best way to learn is to, yeah, simply do it. Get your hands dirty, get to work. Uh, but the second purpose was that we would like to um, learn and study how uh, hexagon technologies could be used uh, to improve the efficiency. So uh, a solar panel, of course, it's important to orient it towards the sun, but it's also very important uh, to keep it cool. So by accurately mapping uh, the panels, the terrain, the surroundings, and develop uh, wind modules, uh, we can optimize the position of the, these uh, solar panels to get most out of it. And it's not always facing directly to the sun. The wind the simulation, which can give better cooling, will improve the efficiency. That is one example. The hexagon R evolution in initiatives have different different legs. I talked about the solar energy. There is also um, yeah, green hydrogen, wind energy simulations. There's a lot about energy storage, uh, plastic and e-waste. But today I will actually more focus on a blue carbon aspect.
This is a movie of a tiger shark. I think every presentation gets better with a movie of a tiger shark, no matter what subject. But actually, on this presentation, it, it has a certain purpose. So our uh, collaborators beneath the waves, they, um, they, they, it's a non-profit organization with the main purpose to uh, uh, protect marine habitats. They have equipped uh, more than 100 tiger sharks with uh, sensors and cameras. Um, and, uh, have, and gathered this data captured by the tiger sharks themselves. And when, while analyzing this data, they realized that the tiger sharks spend a huge amount of time in seagrass meadows. And this also happens to be seagrass meadows that we did not know about. Uh, it appears that one of the biggest, or maybe the biggest, area of seagrass meadows is uh, around Bahamas, and it was discovered actually with this method. Um, these tiger sharks detected these seagrass meadows, which are very important for um, marine life. Um, all kinds of species, not only the tiger sharks, of course. But they are also a very efficient uh, carbon binder. It's actually a more efficient uh, carbon uh, uh, binder than the tropical rainforests. So beneath the waves, they uh, detected that there are a huge area of seagrass meadow, and they started to do studies on the amount of core in the sediment. And they wanted to discover a method how to protect these areas. So they teamed up with the Hexagon and also, also the government of Bahamas to, uh, to map the regions where these sea groves meadows are. It starts with the tiger shark. Um, the data goes to beneath the waves. They go there with scuba divers. They also come with their research uh, vessels. Um, and they do uh, study of the seafloor sediment. And uh, with these methods, so they get like a pinpoint uh, samples of the seafloor. However, it's very time consuming. And this is where Hexagon comes in. So uh, with the airborne LiDAR bathymetry from Hexagon, we can cover uh, big areas quickly. Uh, during, I think, five days, we captured 1,100 square kilometers of uh, Bahama seafloor. That's roughly two thirds of uh, Lake Vettern. And, uh, and it, yeah, it's, it's done from the aircraft. This is an uh, image uh, of Eric. He, he made this presentation, of course. But I would like you to focus on the, on the left side there, the Chiroptera. That's a hexagon uh, airborne LiDAR bathymetry sensor, two laser scanners, high resolution camera. Um, developed and produced here in Jönköping, and it's used to map uh, seafloor, uh, uh, rivers. You get uh, both the uh, data from beneath the water surface, but also on the shoreline. Using this um, hexagon uh, data, together with uh, studies of beneath the waves, we are able to classify the sea floor. So we can, uh, using this airborne data, see where we have sand, where we have macroalgae, where we have different types of uh, seagrass. And with this as an input to uh, the Bahamian government, they will uh, protect these areas and uh, issue carbon credits. So the Bahamian government will get an income by protecting these areas. And at the same time, we will protect these very, very important uh, um, marine life. This is an example of the data. We have uh, high resolution photos 
we overlay it with uh, some point cloud information. And uh, the last layer here is uh, the different categories of uh, Bahamian seafloor. And this can be done on a huge scale, and that is where uh, Hexagon uh, plays an important role. Yeah. This, is, uh, this was one example. There are many examples um, when it comes to uh, all, all kinds of aspects. But if we manage to be more productive and maybe turn direction, let's see what can happen. Yes, so um, our evolution, I've discussed uh, two topics. This is an ongoing yeah, project. Uh, we are always looking for new areas. Maybe these areas are not yet discovered. If you feel that you have an idea that you would like to test, that you think maybe could be part of this our evolution initiative, feel free to contact us. Um, and we take it from there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Torian. Really, really interesting to, to listen to your you. speech. Um, sometimes it takes a revolution, you say. There's a whole lot of data out there. Yes. And from your point of view, what would you say are the key challenges for all of us to putting this data into to good use? Yes. So. Um, as a sensor developer, and I guess also as a surveyor, you really live with your data, you produce a lot of data. Mm. But the problem is if the data stays there. So it's, it's really important that, um, to have a, a workflow, a method, to, um, to maybe take this raw data and turn it to data that can be used yeah, by the users actually doing the, the good stuff Exactly. It. So the data doesn't have a value on its own. It's when it's being used. And that is, that is an important topic. Of course. And yeah. this creating this optimal workflow, what is the key aspect there? How, yes. do we, how do we create that? And what does it look like? Yeah. yeah that, 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 Huge question, it, it, is a good, it is a good question. But um, for instance, Hexagon have a, a content program. Mm -hmm. So. You, you don't need to own your sensor. You don't need to uh, like order the survey. There is a program where you can actually look for data or ask for data. Uh, and if it, the data is there available, you can uh, use it for yeah, whatever need you have. So it, it is a way to present the data to a broader audience. Um, so I don't need to be the data expert. I just need to be able to present what kind of data exactly, I need to exactly, be able to act. Okay. Exactly. Um, it is, this is a complex area, of course. It's a whole lot of data, so many areas to put it to yes. use. Um, but what, if you were to give all of the attendees here uh, an advice for the future, where do, do we start? Um, I think it's always good to start small, mm -hmm. start uh, where you are. I mean, uh, what, what do you have where you are working around you mm -hmm. that can be optimized, uh, done more efficiently? Um, 
how can uh, how can you use available data to maybe optimize for yourself or yeah for all of us <laughs> yeah so start small but still yeah. we are aiming for getting it right by yeah. 2030 it, it is as you say it's a huge topic mm -hmm. the data is everywhere it's uh, on on the smallest scale to the biggest scale uh, and it's a huge amount it, the question is how to make best use of it i would say for sure are you excited for the future and the possibilities that it brings? Well, um, I mean, having, having a work involving uh, lasers and airplanes and now also tiger sharks, <laughs> I mean, it is, uh, it is uh, quite fun. Yes, definitely. It's a mix hard to, yeah. to beat. Uh, yes. Thank you so much, Torbjörn, for taking the time, stepping in on a Thank quick you. note and Thank for you. a very interesting topic. Thank Give you. him a warm round of applause. <laughs> okay.